Question 5 from Section 2 of the 2022 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. A teacher uses a buzzer attached to a string to demonstrate the Doppler effect through a group of students. The buzzer produces a sound of constant frequency and the teacher swings the buzzer at a constant speed in a horizontal circle. There's a diagram there. You can see we're looking down on top of the teacher as though we're stuck to the roof. And you can see the circle in which the teacher is swinging round the buzzer. And the buzzer is going to be approaching the students and is going to be leaving the students as it goes round the other part of the circle. Now, for two marks, we're asked to explain in terms of wave fronts why the frequency of the sound heard by the students is lower as the buzzer moves away from them compared to when the buzzer is moving towards them. And this is really the classic Doppler effect situation. And here's a kind of animation of what is happening here. And you can see that little green dot in the middle of the graph paper represents an observer. And the black rectangle represents a source of sound which is moving. Now as the sound source is moving towards the observer, you can see that the waves are all crushed up because the wave fronts, uh, when they're made by the sound speaker and the sound speaker is moving, the, the sound speaker is catching up with its own wave fronts and therefore the observer is going to actually hear uh, more waves per second, which gives the impression of that higher frequency. As the speaker is moving away from the observer, or the buzzer in this case is moving away from the observer, you can see that it's actually leaving behind its wave fronts as it's moving and therefore the observer is going to hear a lower frequency because they're hearing, uh, they're receiving a less number of wave fronts per second. So that's it summed up for you and that's the kind of diagram you have to draw. Draw the speaker or the buzzer and as the buzzer approaches it's going to have its waves crushed up at the front and it's going to have its waves kind of spread out at the back and that gives the impression as the buzzer approaches you you're going to hear a higher frequency more wave fronts per second and as the buzzer is going away from you you're going to actually have less wave fronts per second arriving at you which means you're going to hear a lower frequency so any diagram like that would suffice Question 5 continued, Part B. The teacher uses the Doppler effect model to explain the observations of the light emitted by a binary star system. A binary star system consists of two stars that orbit a common fixed point. You can see the diagram there showing you that star A, if we are on Earth, would be seen to be approaching us, and star B would be seen to be going away from us. So that's why the Doppler effect can be used to explain the spectra from these stars. And that's what the next part of the question is about. It says line spectra are obtained from the stars in the binary system and compared with the line spectrum from the Sun. Part of the spectra for star B and the Sun are shown below. So there's the Sun's emission spectrum from a particular element and that's star B. As you can see star B uh, the emission spectrum has been, in fact, red-shifted, moved towards what we call the, the longer wavelength. And that's because, in fact, that star B is moving away from us. And when it's moving away from us, it's got the same effect as the Doppler effect with the buzzer. As the buzzer moves away from us, we hear a low-frequency sound, a lot lower frequency. So in this case, the wavelengths are going to get stretched out just as the same way as the buzzer. So that's the situation we've got there, that's what we call red shift. Now we scroll down, we can see what the question is all about. It says, 5B, I, one of the lines in the spectrum from the sun, has a wavelength of 580 nanometers. The wavelength of the corresponding line in the spectrum from star B has wavelength 610 nanometers. And we have to calculate for three marks the red shift of star B. Now immediately we go to our relationship sheet, as you can see, a, a portion of it there and you can see Z which is going to be the redshift and it's defined as the wavelength observed from the star take away the wavelength we observe at rest in the laboratory on Earth divided by the wavelength we observe uh, in the laboratory on Earth. Now we can calculate that quite easily because we've got the wavelengths in but part two for five marks which is quite a bit of a calculation is asking us to determine the approximate distance from Earth to the binary star system. Now you can see those three important equations here we have. You can see we've got Z, that's the Z shift equation there, the red shift equation. We can work that out. Once we work that out, 
we can plug it into this equation here to find the recessional speed v that's moving away from us. And once we've got that, and also with Hubble's law, we can work out the distance d, the actual binary star system is away from us. So just by observing the line spectra of stars, we can work out how fast they're moving away from us, and we also can work out how far they're away from us uh, using the great Hubble equation here. So let's start off then. We use the Z shift to calculate first of all in part one, and that's going to be the observed wavelength, which is going to be 610 nanometers. Take away the wavelength observed on the Earth, 580, divided by 580. So that's going to give us a value of 0 0.052. So we've now, in fact, calculated the red shift. Now what we have to do is calculate the velocity of recession of the binary star. So we can rearrange that Z equals V upon C to give us quite simply V is going to equal to ZC, which is going to be equal to 0 0.052 multiplied by the speed of light 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Remember, the Z shift, the red shift, has got no units, so it's just a number multiplying the speed of light. And we get a speed of light, uh, sorry, the speed of recession to be 1.56 times 10 to the power 7 meters per second. So that's us now got the recessional speed which this binary system is moving away from us, one of the stars moving away from us. So we jump on to the next equation then. And the next equation is going to be V is going to be equal to the Hubble constant H naught times D. And therefore we can put down the rearrangement of that. We can say that distance D is going to equal to the recessional velocity V divided by Hubble's constant. That gives us the distance which the, the binary star system is away from the Earth. So we've got V, and it's going to be 1.56 times 10 to the power 7 metres per second, divided by Hubble's constant. And if you look that up in your relationship sheet, so data sheet, you get a value of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds minus 1. You can see the two seconds minus ones cancel out and you're left with the unit meter, which is a length. So if we do that in my calculator, we end up with a value of 6.78 times 10 to the power 24 meters. So that binary star system is that distance away. But the main thing to learn about this problem is once we know the redshift Z, we can easily work out the recessional velocity by jumping on to the next equation. And once we know the the recessional velocity by rearranging the z equals v upon c, we can then jump on to Hubble's equation, Hubble's law, v equals h naught d. So by simply looking at the redshift of the emission spectra from these uh, stars that are moving away from us, we can jump into a uh, calculation to tell us the recessional speeds, how fast it's moving away from us, and also we can work out how far away it is from us, and that's amazing. Question 5 continued, part C, part I. At one instant in their orbits, the around a fixed point, the stars in the binary system are 3.44 times 10 to the power 12 metres apart. The mass of star A is 2.19 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms, and the mass of star B is 1.8 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms. And for three marks, we're asked to calculate the gravitational force between star A and star B at that particular instant. Well, there's a little diagram of what's happening. There's star A there, and star A is going to have a mass of 2.19, 2.19 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms. And star B is going to have a mass of 1.80 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms. We can call this one M1, and we can call this one M2, and R is the distance between the centres of the two stars. So we know which equation we're going to use. We're going to use this famous equation here. F equals G M1 M2 upon R squared. And that's the universal equation of gravitation. And we also know that the value of G, if we can take a wee note of it here, G has got a value of uh, 6.67 times 10 to the power 
times 10 to minus 11. So we're in a good position to work this out. There's no any complications in it. So we put in our equation. F equals G. First of all, G is going to be 6.67. 6.67 times 10 to the power minus 11. I'm going to leave out the units for the moment. Times the first mass, 2.19 times 10 to the power 30, and times the other mass, 1.80 times 10 to the power 30. Put a bracket around that to help your calculation. I'm going to divide that by, and here comes the important part, the distance R between the centres squared. So it's going to be 3.44 times 10 to the power 12, and we have to square that. That's a, a case where some people forget to do that and it's simple when you do it right down the excitement right down the equation you forget to square things so we end up with our calculator given the answer that the force comes out to be 2.22 and it's going to be times 10 to the 25 newtons that's going to be the force of attraction between those two binary stars Part 2. At another point in the orbits, the distance between the stars is half that in CI. State how many times greater the gravitational force between star A and star B is at this point compared to C in part I. So let's take a close look at this gravitational force equation. F equals G M1 M2 all over R squared. Now G is a constant. M1 and M2 is a constant, so we can see that the force is really equal to a constant over the distance between them squared. Now let's take an example if we actually double the distance between the two stars. What will be the equation give us now then? Well the equation here is going to be F equals K, this time is going to be bracket 2R squared. We're doubling the distance, and that becomes K over 4R squared. So if we compare both this one and this one, we can see that if we've doubled the distance, we have in fact quartered the force. Now see if we can spy a connection here. What happens if we triple the distance? Well, triple the original distance of r, we'll get k over 3r, all squared. That's going to give us k over 9r squared. So really effectively we triple the distance between the two stars. We 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 multiply the force by one ninth. So by tripling a distance, we multiply it by one ninth. And that can go on and on. We can see the pattern now. If we make the distance four times as big, then we're going to make the gravitational force between them one sixteenth of original size. But what happens if we go the other way? What happens if we half the distance between them? K over bracket one half R all squared. We're halving the distance between them. That comes out to be k over one quarter r squared. And that's equal to 4k over r squared. So you can see, comparing the original one, we have multiplied the force by four times, but just halving it. So if we multiply it by one half, the distance between the, the two binary stars, we have in fact multiplied the force by four. And we can do the same by making it three times closer together. K over one third R all squared is going to give us K over one ninth R squared, which is equal to 9K over R squared. So you can see that we have, in fact, made it nine times as big just by the fact that we have reduced the distribution by one third. And that gives us nine. So there you can see what we mean by the inverse square law. If we double the distance, we quarter it. Think of the square. If we multiply the distance by 3 between the two uh, stars, it's the same as going 3, 3 to 9. We one ninth it. If we quadruple the distance between the stars, we effectively one sixteenth the size of the force between them. And it goes the opposite way as well. If we half the distance between them, 2 to the 4 is going to be 4 times. See the inverse of it? That's going to be times 2 is going to be 2 squared. And we inverse it to give us 1 quarter. 3 squared is going to give us inverse of that, 1 9. Inverse means turn it upside down. 4 is going to be give you 16. And it's going to be 1 16th. And 1 half is going to give you 1 quarter. 
and if you inverse that you get four one third you're going to square that to give you one ninth but if you inverse it you get nine so our original question is the following and it's really wise to see that pattern what we call the inverse square law it says at another point that orbits the distance between the stars is half that in c so one half is the distance and you can see that the force is going to be four times as big just by following our simple inverse square law